We got the coffee, man. Now we're gonna talk about some mixing. Yes. And yeah. since we're gonna start with the drums, I would like to quote Ginger Baker. Yeah. And he once said, if you have a great drummer and some so-so musicians, you still have like a great band. If you have a so-so drummer and some great musicians, you'll have a so-so band. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Drummers have a very specific sound, the good ones. I remember re recording Ricky from Cataract uh, 10 years ago on, uh, in my studio, and then he came back uh, two years later in a different studio, different drum kit, different equipment, different rooms, everything was different, and it sounded exactly the same. The first time he hit a snare, it sounded the same because he just, has that sound. I don't, I can't explain it. How oh. can it sound yeah. so, you know, that specific for him? Yeah. But it really does. It's an important uh, point about sound also is timing. Yeah. And uh, these days, a lot of people are using Beat Detective to fix everything up and not realizing that they're not only killing spirit and personality that way, they're also killing sound because part of the sound starts already with the timing. Yeah. Which is why we love Dave Lombardo and Tom Hunting of Exodus. And you know, a, a lot of great drummers are defined by the timing. And if you start fixing them, it's not that drummer anymore, so. But can you uh, can you walk us through uh, the the drum part? And of course, mixing. Toby from TC is an awesome drummer as well. And I just happened to record him yesterday. This is the drums that the way that we set everything up, the way we left it yesterday, it sounds like. And I have two mics inside the drum, bass drum that goes like this. And I have one outside in a, an extra Ludwig 24 inch metal bass drum that sounds like this. If you listen to the whole drum kit and muting that uh, Ludwig, it's very tight. Adding that feels like adding Led Zeppelin or Ginger Baker. You could also have two videos. One with a Boy Scout and one with a caveman. Yes, I like cavemen. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and uh, I grew up on Led Zeppelin, so I like that, you know, big drum sound where everything is yeah. big and dangerous. So I, I really do enjoy getting some of that. Sometimes that can be too wishy-washy for metal production, but I like to try and maintain that uh, character of sound. For that extra kick, we'll do that at the end, see if some samples can maybe help us, but let's first go through the tracks. I like the snare tracks to go into a group where I compress and EQ the two tracks together. This is what it sounds clean. And with a bit of gate and compression added. Um, also, if I'm using a snare sample, I will run that into the same group so that the, the snare sample will stay more or less the same at the same level, but the natural snare will always be changing, not only in levels, but also in tuning and for hitting the snare in different positions. So they will be in a constant moving thing and being natural is what it's all about for me, keeping yeah. that sound. The toms I have, a no some noise gate and um, a little bit of compression and some EQing to adjust the three toms to so have more or less the same sound. Then I run them into a group where I have a different EQ, group EQ, so that if I think all the toms need more click or mids or low end or something, I can do that to all the toms collectively. The overhead is kind of clean, um, the way it's recorded. Um, I think it sounds awesome, not much to say about that. I have four sets of ambient mics, stereo sets of ambient mics. If we like take these one of the mics and listen to them with no processing 
and then with quite a bit of compression, you can really get a lot of the, the room sound of the pool. I like to smash them really hard, but sometimes a slower release will be more suited. You'll hear, notice that the drums sound tighter without yeah. the hard, comp fast compression. Now it's more like yeah. And everything together without the room mic and without the Ludwig drum. Even though it's at the bottom of a pool and tiled walls all yeah. around and everything should be really noisy and messy, it's not. It's okay. quite tight already. Yeah, and then I decide how much, how much room I want. Or big and noisy. I like big and noisy, but I think for this track it's going to be too much to go as far as this. Yes, yeah, of course. But like any good uh, show on TV about baking cakes, I cheated and put some samples in. And they're not the greatest sounding samples in the world by any means. And why are you using samples? Actually, to maintain that Led Zeppelin ish. Kind of, or like that big room sound, the sound of the pool and get that whole big thing. But it kind of washes away the distinct punch in the chest or the stomach. Mm. It's nice to have a constant that you can blend in. And also sometimes you have a really nice bass drum sound, but you just find yourself, oh, it would be nice to have a little bit more some frequencies, something that it adds. So sometimes I use a sample just if I have a shitty bass drum recording with no low end, I just roll off everything down to maybe 100 hertz or 80. So it's only like... The bass drum, this uh, kick sample sounds like this. Huh. With... Uh, I mean, there's no dynamics whatsoever. It's all the yeah, same. I, I think there is a little bit, but it's like down to 2% or something. But the, the dynamics we get from the original tracks. Exactly. And this is the constant I'm looking for to yeah. beef up the... And the same goes for the snare, which is a weirdo sound that goes like this. It adds a little bit of that yeah. snap that I think the snare is missing by itself. And, um, but how much I want to use of this is really down to what the whole mix is going to sound like at the end, because I do like the sound of the whole drum kit as it is now. Yeah. Um, but I also know that once we pile guitars and bass on top, maybe some of those uh, punches are gonna disappear a little bit in the mix and adding these samples will just help you actually hear what is already there, but it'll just put emphasis to it. If we listen to the drums without the samples and then I will try to add them as we're listening. It really, it's like far back, and then when you put the samples, it like moves right up here, but you still have the whole bigness. That's yeah. not really a word, yeah, yeah, yeah. is it? But the whole bigness. Yeah. <laughs> you still have that whole thing, but you can, you get that punch. And then it's a matter of taste, how loud you want those ambience mics and stuff. We'll see about that when we have all the other instruments. Uh, is it common to uh, use uh, samples in metal? Yes, it is. Very common. I mean, for some things, it's... Uh, and especially when when you have extreme parts, like really fast double bass parts, we don't have any of those here. But of course, if you're playing at super fast speed, yeah. uh, you can't hit the bass drum as hard. And usually these drummers have set up with a bunch of pillows in the bass drum to get a response just to they're really playing with the trigger rather than with the drum. And uh, of course you need samples for stuff like that. Yeah. Even when I have drummers like that, I always try to see how much of a natural drum, kick, drum kit sound can we get from this. But machines can help us sometimes. 
Right on. Yeah. Let's move on to the bass. Yes. Uh, we recorded two tracks. One signal went through the Spectra drive. Usually I would either do that or just record a clean bass track that I would then process in the mix, kind of like what we have here. Ah, uh, let's hear it clean. Which is a really nice sounding, sort of cleanish, uh, yeah. in my world, this is the clean sounding bass. <laughs> um, and it's about getting that low end in in a clean, solid way so that I always have that for keeping a solid low end for the mix. And then we ran, split the signal and ran the other side to through an amp and a distortion overdrive pedal. Yep. Which is this nasty thing and together sound like this. I run both of them into an auxiliary group and compress them together uh, with a four band compressor, which is the fourth band I use to just, you know, turn it down. I could use a cutoff filter as well, but I'm using it to get the sub, the really low subs compressed so they are solid and I get the whole mid range, the, where the tone is present and then the whole clicky part of the bass sound to make which I compress really hard because I don't want that to sound which can be especially if you have a finger playing bass player can a lot of times be like and get those picky sounds in the mix sound horrible but if I compress them really hard it can be a solid part of the sound that I can actually help shape the sound if you listen to it like this you can see here's the the high area, how it's compressed really hard. But now I can raise that area. And it never gets annoying because it doesn't have those surprising stick out uh, uh, sounds. Finding the, the overdrive helps me defining that area where the bass can stick its head through the wall of guitars, which we're of course going to do like guitars everywhere. <laughs> and then you need to find your spot for the bass because yeah. I do want to hear the bass in the mix. And now for the guitar. Yes. What do we have? I think I mentioned earlier that I did not record a DI signal, but I did. I just forgot already because I'm really old. But. Um, it that, that's a great thing about being old. I mean, you get pleasant surprises like, wow, I do actually have that extra track that I thought I didn't. Exactly. Yep. It makes editing, if that's needed, a lot easier because it's a lot easier looking at this, trying to edit something, than looking at these walls of sound distortions. So for things. the sake of editing, you might even do a DI track and not using it for anything else than just... I use it, I always record it um as a backup solution because what if you don't like the guitar sound in two weeks when you start mixing okay then you have the option of running it through the amp again yeah. and getting a sound you do like i did do one album where i didn't recently because everybody were like yeah it's the best guitar sound ever and then it turned out it wasn't and we didn't have a di signal and it was okay. hell getting it so yes. I always do it, except for that one time. I ran the same amp through two different cabinets. So can you play with the eye again? And can you, uh, can you actually, with the, the clean signal you have, make that kind of sound? Yeah. I can run it through an amp and, and or use some simulation. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of guitar sims though. I think a lot of them sound really, really good. But in metal, the guitar sound is about 80% of the whole sound you're hearing. And for me, it's like whenever I'm using digital simulations, it's like the guitar sound is here. Very flat. And if it's a tube amp, 
it's like here. Yeah. You can put your hand into the rehearsal room and, okay. and yeah. point at, you know, yeah. pick at someone. And for that reason alone, I would always prefer a real amp. Yeah. We use two cabs. And right now I like this one better. It's a La Boca cabinet, the other one is a Marshall cabinet. I think like this is yeah. a pretty good mix, which yeah. we do the same. Yeah, two, one guitar on the left, one on the right. Yeah. With all the other tracks, it sounds like this. I also run all the guitar tracks into a group, so yeah. that sometimes I will EQ a little bit on the separate tracks, but I like to, if I'm using multiple microphones, like in this one, there's two different cabinets and of course two microphones. Sometimes there's a character in one of the mics I don't like and I will put an EQ and get rid of some stuff I'm not happy with. But I like to play more with the levels of the uh, different, you know, like like you just saw me do before. Yeah. Like, I like this one. What happens if I add a little bit of this? Ah, uh, it takes away something from the other one, but... Mm. And, and then finding those sweet spots. And usually I will do this already when recording. Uh, I don't need the guitars to be like a constant wall of sound. It's okay if you play unk, unk, that you get some extra push in the low, as long as it doesn't, you know, go crazy and mm. destroy the mix. To begin with, I would just go with a simple EQ, sweep it around a little bit to see are there some good qualities that I would like to hear more, like this. I would go through stuff like that and see, ah, this is where the guitar sounds really nice for this part and, and you know, find the good sound. And then if... Uh, if that's up here, it leaves a nice room for this little bump you have on the bass guitar. So the, you have the guitars like away from that same area where you're hearing the bass. Mm. With guitar sounds like this, you have very limited space for the bass. You've got to find your moment to shine and that's right here. Okay, going back to the drum samples a little bit, because now we have a lot of noise happening. We do. And we were actually listening with the drum sample, with the kick and snare samples. If I mute those, You hear that punch is gone. Mm. But with the symbol, you got that back. Yeah. And that's what I was talking about. Uh, we have a solo. Should we talk about we that? We have a solo. We also have some harmony guitars and stuff, but they're awesome. Should we, uh, should we go through it? We have some octaves here. Yep. Let's run that into a separate group. If we listen to it with nothing else, this is what it sounds like. I have a number of a wide variety of different doubling choruses and pitch shifters and all kinds of stuff. And it's, uh, there's one I always come back to, which is um, from my day as a guitar player, I had the TC2290 in my setup and I had this um, 
uh, preset I always used, and when I started having a studio, that preset just stayed on it, and yeah. and I didn't touch that machine for years, and it was um, really a, a very 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 subtle chorus and slow, but then with the return was face reversed so that. Uh, in rehearsal, it sounded like I was all over the place. But in the studio, it was a really nice spreader to add to something that was a, uh, essentially a mono signal. But I wanted it to stay mono, but not quite mono. Have something. Yeah. Probably better to hear it on the solo because it is a mono signal. So I'll just kill everything on that and then try to add it while it's playing solo. <laughs> It just adds. It's widening. Yes, and uh, in the mix, that's sounds like. Sometimes, if I have a mono solo or a guitar part that I, that is on the border of being drowned and everything else, but if I make it a little, just a little bit louder. It, gets too loud, then this effect can, you know, put some side information in the oh. mix. And it doesn't really get any louder. It just fills out the side speakers and, mm. and um, somehow it, it that makes the solo work. We could maybe add some lush delay soup like this. <laughs> Which is a multiple tap delay, like uh, okay. I think six different uh, delays feeding into each other and just making a mess. Yeah, but um, could work really nice. It's a matter of taste, if you like. It does make it sound a little bit more like a church, but it also pulls the part back into the music, yeah. and that's a matter of taste. Do you want it to be part of the whole thing, yeah. or do you want it to stand out and be more in your face? Then we shouldn't add that. We are ready to listen to some vocals. And uh, let's hear it. Lay me in my mind has been changing. That's what Simon sounds like. Yep. I always run some compression, sometimes really hard. Lay me in my mind has been changing. A bit of EQ to find, same as with the guitar, finds where the spot where his voice is, um, is biting. Lay me in my mind has been changing. We'll see with the music how that goes. I run, in this case, all the vocals into one group again, use a four band compressor again, to make sure that whenever we double something or uh, triple or quadruple something that the levels don't get away. So I'm keeping every, there is of course the danger that one really loud part will push away another one, and then you have to separate them in groups. Yeah. I think for this particular uh, song and mix and the dubs that we did, it works really well uh, like this. Lay me in my mind has been changing. Maybe put a bit of DS I think it. it might be lack of simulation. I want to show uh, the same preset as before, the TZ2290, mm -hmm. um, that I use for spreading out the vocals. Okay. If, if you listen to the vo vocal solo, and then I will add that effect. Lay me in my mind has been changing. Same with the 2290. Lay me in my mind has been changing. Just 
makes him fill up the whole space. It's also very nice for most singers who are singing to have that effect in the yeah. headphones when they're singing. I do, however, have this new thing that I should connect. Do it. The TC Helicon. Helicon. Which ha also has a very nice uh, um, Doppler effect and a yeah. bunch of other stuff, but yeah. uh, not all of it is su suitable for this. We'll connect Maybe not it. the auto tune. Yes. That for this will song. completely freak out. Yeah. It's a little big and bulky for your desk, but you don't mind about it? No, it's uh, mainly just uh, once I set it up, I can put it over here. Yeah, of course. So it's nice to be able to pull just as the same as yeah. these dongles that you can, while you're getting your sound, you can pull it out and work on it like this yeah. and then put it to the side. Lay me in my mind has been changing. It's basically doubling Simon up and making him sound bigger. Again, woe and behold, this is one of my favorites, as you might start to think. My two spread preset for the 2290. Yeah. Um, I have that inserted on the Helicon with the mix not set to 100 because I don't want it to di disappear altogether. And I like to get that down the middle uh, double, but also get some side information from mm -hmm. this. And this is just such an awesome way to uh, achieve that. Lay me in my mind has been changing. I think it's time to hear what it sounds like with the music, because this will sound really weird a lot of times soloing it, yeah. but it's all about what works within the music. So I'm gonna start dry, no effects on the vocals, and then start adding them as we're playing the track. I think it might be like a simulation. I feel the touch from the human race. Just makes me want to move away I decided to reject society That rejected me long ago And now you got one guy in front of a microphone sounding like a whole bunch of zombies But it's still just one vocal performance yeah. and that to me, you know, there, there are a lot of different scenarios that work, but I do really like personally one guy saying his stuff to me personally. Mm. And as soon as you start doubling up everything, it's kind of like you're taking away that personality thing and it becomes more like in this case, a bunch of zombies and you kind of know if you see a bunch of zombies that it's not real but if it's one guy spitting in your face then you know it's real and you better shut up and run and this kind of music is all about scaring people this kind of music should scream for your attention at all times and that's my purpose for this so that concludes the vocal mixing and now we just uh, need to tidy up uh, a bit of uh, details, I guess. Yeah, put some little gimmicks here and there and uh, see if we need some magic powder somewhere. And adding stuff like this, yeah. little effects here and there will make the whole thing uh, come to life. Also to bring a bit more emphasis on the heaviness of a part like this, we could add some um, really nice reverb. Ah, uh, here we go. Sounds kind of gated as well. And that's but, but, just the gate and the snare. Okay, but the, that gets enhanced by the reverb. Yeah, but the reverb is also this thing. Um, which is... 8 to 10. 
Yes. But even though there is a lot of room information in the drum tracks already, it can sometimes, just with like with the samples, bring mm. a different character into it that you didn't know you needed until you heard it. And could also be a good idea to maybe put some of that on the bass drum. Just for this part? Yeah, yeah. Not for the, because... Not for the song, it gets, gets yeah. washed away in the song. <laughs> awesome. There was a guitar part. Do, 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 do. Yeah, no yeah. one used to say Shouldn't we put that up? Oh my God. This part, the snare drum, would it be really weird to have a reverse snare drum in front of the snare, so it... I don't know. Not so middle-ish, maybe. Uh, but I just love that kind of thing. I mean, Def Leppard probably did it. Fat Ludwig with reverb to that's the one we're gonna use. <laughs> And then we need to make it sound good. Minor detail. So the question is, if if it's gonna be there, should it be on all the time, or is it nice that it's just every other time? I think it's better every other time. Okay. Actually. I think uh, it's close to a mix. Do you want to do anything more with the uh, solo guitar? Or would that be weird? We can do all kinds of stuff. I quite like this one, kind of dry. It's not really dry, it has that spreader yeah. thing and a delay on the end, but yeah. it's plenty aggressive. And I think putting too much uh, gravy on it will just uh, take away from that. I like that slayerish kind of nature it has right now. This will actually uh, round up mixing metal thing, part five. Mastering is coming up. Thank <laughs> you.